go try something else. He didn't cross the street. Sometimes life is confusing, frustrating, not always, but sometimes it is. And being a pastor for as long as I have, I've seen people, they just kind of give up. They get tired of the confusion and the question, they just kind of fade away. But God has called us to be faithful. The Spirit would say to us, don't leave, don't go. Habakkuk had, had complained, he had, he, had, he had emptied himself of his complaints. It was time to move on. We tell God how we feel, and then we say, God, I'm going to wait for you to answer me. That's what Habakkuk did. He climbed up into the tower, and he waited for God to answer him. This illusionment will pass, and God will come with an answer. But if we leave, then we're never going to get that answer. If we leave in confusion, and we say, this is not working, then we're never going to hear what God has to say to us. We'll still watch this video, please. Waiting. A minute can seem like an hour, an hour like a day, and a day like a week. We want things to run on our schedule, not someone else's. Somewhere along the way, we've developed the idea that the world revolves around us, and others should wait for us, not us for them. We want God to answer our prayers now. We don't understand when God doesn't respond immediately. We fret and pace and project all kinds of thoughts. We get angry, frustrated, resentful of God's inactivity. And there's nothing we can do about it. We can't force him, or will him, or bribe him, or cajole him into responding to us soon. He comes in his own time. And so we lose our patience. We lose heart and become apathetic towards him. But then, just at the right time, and according to his own schedule, God appears. Right on time. Not our time, but his. Not on our schedule, but his. Not when we want him to appear, but when he decides to appear. And somehow, if we're just a little patient, we get on board and realize that his timing is perfect. Yes, that's right. He's never late and never early. He's always right on time. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Sometimes it's hard to wait, isn't it? But the Bible is full of that admonishment to us to wait for the Lord. Because the Lord hears us when we pray. And the Lord responds. I have a hard time waiting. You don't know how hard, how easy it is, or how lucky we are <laughs> to live in Indiana. If you go to the BMV in Indiana, or I just went to the BMV recently in Plainfield, I mean, they waited on me within, I don't know, 10 minutes. When we lived in Southern California, we went to the uh, Los Angeles BMV. And it might have been the Los Angeles BMV. Or, okay. Well, I remember the line. They had the building so that you can have the line go all the way around the building, you know, and come back around. And so it's like an all-day event. You're waiting in line. I remember that my, sharp, my, my wife and I, went, I had to drop her off and just say, get in line. And then I'll come back and check them and see where you're at because I have a real hard time waiting in line. So, so we're lucky. But many times in life we have to wait. But as we wait, we have to, this is your third point, believe that God will answer. God is a God of mercy and compassion. God is a God of light. God is not a God of static. He's going to hear us. He's going to come to us. And He's going to answer us. I don't know how long it will take, but
but it'll be on his time, not going to be on my time. may not be as soon as we like, but he's going to come. I can remember uh, a very dark time in, in my life, a difficult time, and uh, this goes back several years, but my wife and I, we moved to Milwaukee. I went to Milwaukee to attend uh, Marquette University to do some graduate work in theology, and while I was there, there was this very small, struggling Christian drug rehab program that was struggling because no one knew what they were doing, basically. They were trying hard, and I had worked in this field for, for many years, and so they asked me to be the director. And so I became the director, and, and, and God blessed us. My wife and I, as we did it, we worked hard, and God blessed us, and pretty soon we, were, uh, we hired some staff. We opened up a residential program for guys who had drug and alcohol program problems, and, and uh, we had some money in the bank. We were looking for property to expand and to build a new facility to go from, we only had, we only had licensing for eight people, but we wanted to go from 20 to 25. And so looking for property, and I learned something that was kind of, you know, I was younger and I was, didn't know how some things worked, but I realized that when things were going bad, no one wants to be in charge. When things are going good, Lots of people want to be in charge. And so I had a, it was a nonprofit organization, and I had a board president, and you know, I thought we were friends. But he began to do some things that I thought was sloppy. It wasn't, it wasn't illegal, but I thought it was manipulative, and I thought it was a power play on his part. And so I called him on it in a board meeting. And I didn't mean to insult him. But I, I did, and and I could have I probably should have said it differently. But I didn't mean to say anything uh, wrong or bad. I was just trying to tell him what I thought was happening was right, and uh, I embarrassed him, and he decided that he wanted my job. And so the the conflict began. I realized that um, I was going to have to resign, or the conflict would be so deep that I was going to like tear the organization apart. And we had just worked so hard to build it up, and so I backed out. The organization's doing fine. Actually, the denomination came in and cleared out the board after I left. A little bit too late. But so there I was. I felt like I'd been cheated. That I had worked hard to build this up, and I was out. And didn't have a job. Ended up living in this house that these people belonged. They were in Florida for the winter. We were living in their house, and they were coming back. I didn't have a job. But I was disillusioned. Uh, my son was not even one year old. He's now almost 19, so it was 19 years ago. It was a real hard time. And I can remember praying. Because I had pretty much had my life planned out. You know, I was going to do this for a while, and I was going to do this, and I was going to do this. I had it all planned until retirement. I had my life planned out. And this was not part of the plan. And so I said, God, I said, what are you doing? Are you trying to kill me? And I felt the Holy Spirit said, well, yeah, that's what I'm doing. That's not what I wanted to hear. But I realized that I had to die to some things in my life that I wanted. Because honestly, starting a church was not in my plan back then. But I had to die to the things that I wanted. And I didn't die easily, I'll tell you. I was squirming and I was objecting every step of the way. And I still need that process of death in my life. But piece by piece, God began to uh, put, put our lives back together and, and, and give us things to hope for. But it was, it was, a, it was a time there where I was disillusioned. But I know looking back now, almost 20 years later, that that was a good thing in my life. That, that changed my life. That I'm a different person now than I was back then. And I think I'm a better person. And I learned that the journey that I'm on is not the journey that I choose. It's the journey that's been given to me. You know, there's so many things in life that we don't really choose. The journey is the journey that's given to us. But if we're faithful in what has been given to us, and we're faithful in that journey that God has given to us, I believe that journey will lead us as it does Habakkuk into the very heart of God. And, and, and that is where I find the goodness of the universe. It's in the heart of God. And He's taken us on that journey. 
So the answer came to Habakkuk. It's a very, very simple answer. This is what he says. He says, the righteous live by his faith. That might sound familiar because Paul wrote the book of Romans on that theme. The righteous shall live by faith. So he's saying to Habakkuk, uh, the wicked does not destroy the righteous. Because the righteous, we have this relationship with God. We have this life that is in Christ Jesus. And even though things may not go the way we want them to, the thing that is the most important will never be taken away from us. And that is that relationship, that companionship, that faith that we have. So he says to Habakkuk that you'll always live. You're not going to die. But he also talks about the wicked. He said the wicked is going to get theirs. He said don't worry about them. I'll take care of that. He says woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. Will not his debtors arise up? Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors so that he might look upon their nakedness. They will be filled with shame and they will be exposed. So God says to Habakkuk, He says the righteous will always live because of their faith, because of my faithfulness, no matter what the circumstance. But don't worry about the wicked prospering. Because in the end, the wicked do not prosper. So what do we do while we're waiting for God? We rejoice in our relationship with Christ Jesus. If we look at this book of Habakkuk, we can see that Habakkuk's situation did not change. It was the same. The Babylonians were still coming. They were still ruthless and they were still merciless. And they were still marauders. But God changed Habakkuk. This is what it says in Habakkuk 3, one of the fine verses, the great verses of the Bible. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. Habakkuk writes, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. So at the first of the book,